morning. We're here today with Dr. Robert van der Plank, Emeritus Fellow of Kellogg College, Oxford, Director of the Kellogg College Centre for the Study of Lifelong Language Learning, and until his retirement in late 2016, Director of Oxford University Language Centre. Welcome and thank you for talking to us. It's my pleasure. So, Dr. van der Plank, could you tell us about the earliest stages in your career back in Edinburgh or in Oxford? Certainly, yes. Well, I suppose my academic career really started um, after my uh, doctorate at Edinburgh, which, of course, was a great centre of applied linguistics study and research um, in the late 70s and 1980s, as it is still today. Um, after a couple of years drifting around, I was offered an opportunity to spend two years teaching at the University of Helsinki. And it was while I was there watching a lot of Finnish television, um, English language programs with Finnish subtitles, uh, that I realized how useful um, subtitles were. These were, of course, translation subtitles, and I learned a lot of Finnish from these subtitles. During that two years, I heard that there were same language subtitles available on programs broadcast by the BBC and ITV in the United Kingdom, uh, and I thought, this would be wonderful for language learning. So at the end of two years, I um, took up a, a job at uh, the University of Newcastle uh, and um, immediately set about trying to find out about these um, same language subtitles, which I learned were called um, uh, teletext subtitles available on page 888 of the teletext system. It took me uh, about a year to really get much concrete information about these um, subtitles, by which time I was at Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh. And from there, my Teletext 888 project really took off. Um, it was quite difficult at the time because um, you couldn't record the, the subtitles on any normal video recorder. They were, of course, they were, of course, VHS video recorders at the time, but they didn't record the subtitles. And I had to get this little magic box that would do it. It was very elaborate and rather difficult to, to record them, but it worked in the end. Um, and also there were copyright problems, so I had to get permission from the BBC, not altogether easy, to record and use programs for educational purposes. In the end, Philips brought out a great video recorder with this add-on for, for fixing captions on um, audiovisual recordings, and it was really from there that my project took off. Um, I was in an absolutely ideal position. I was in charge of the exchange student English language program, and I had about 100 exchange students from top university schools of interpreting and translating and university departments from all over Europe. Absolutely ideal. Uh, and so I use them in, in my research. Uh, and um, they are the ones that uh, I report on in my first publication in English Language Teaching Journal, ELTJ, in 1988. And then again, another group in system in 1990. I stayed at Harriet Watt until um, 1996 and continue to publish articles and give talks on these um, Teletext 888 subtitles. Um, by 1996, I thought that really I had almost said all I could about uh, these uh, subtitles and the offer of a job at Oxford came up and so I moved down south from Edinburgh to Oxford. I really hoped that when I came to Oxford, I would be able to shift my research from English over into other foreign languages, because after all, I was director of the Language Centre at Oxford, multilingual environment and so on, very, very good language library, and lots of potential participants for experiments. But I then found, much to my shock and dismay, that um, they, the subtitles weren't available in European languages. 
or if they were, then they were very hard to find. So, for example, there was no great network of French language subtitles on French language programs for the deaf and hard of hearing. Didn't exist. Didn't exist in Spain, Germany, Italy, or other countries. Um, so there was very little I could do. I wrote a few more articles on English um, captions on English programs, but decided to, to do other things and work on other research projects. And it was only in about 2009 that I was drawn back into the whole field of television and language learning when the editor of language teaching um, invited me to do a state-of-the-art review uh, for his journal. And I looked at what had gone on uh, in the previous 10 years, and the result was my, my review called Déjà Vu, uh, which covered language labs, television and language learning, closed captions, and really sort of soft technology, very little IT in this. Um, I, I called it sort of soft technology. Um, I was quite surprised at how little progress uh, had been made since I had left the field. Mostly people were replicating what we had done before. And they were coming up with the, the, the same findings that um, captions uh, help learners understand programs better, uh, that they increase vocabulary, knowledge, and, and so on. Not, not much more than that. There were a few negative studies, but usually because the researchers were trying to use captions with groups that had quite low-level uh, language skills. Um, I missed uh, a couple of very good articles, one in particular by Mitterer and McQueen, uh, which showed the complete superiority of captions over translation subtitles when it comes to lexically guided retuning of one's phonological perceptions. Uh, it's a wonderful article uh, and really it does transform the scene because it's so, so conclusive. Very, very well conducted piece of research. Uh, this led to me being invited to um, a symposium uh, at the University of Pavia uh, a couple of years later, which was held to mark the end of a big um, pan-European project uh, on subtitles and language learning. Uh, and the subtitles covered both translation subtitles and same language subtitles. And I was a, uh, a guest speaker at this fantastic symposium, which is now um, the main parts of the symposium are now in, in book form, I think, under that title uh, as well. Um, and so I had been brought back into television and language learning. Um, and it was a pleasure to be back because so much had happened, in a sense, since, since I'd been away. Um, then I was approached by a publisher who said, well, you know, you are writing on television and language learning again why don't you bring out a whole book on, on your um, experience of television and language learning and, and subtitles? So I did. Um, and the book was coming along quite nicely. Uh, and then at one point, um, when I was putting the chapters together, I realized there was a big gap in the book uh, and that I really was going over old ground too much and I didn't have really new things to say. That I hadn't carried out what I said I would do at the Pavia uh, conference, which was to come back to Oxford and do a, a, a multilingual research project on, on captions. Uh, so, with the help of the librarian at the Language Centre at Oxford, we um, collected a load of DVDs um, in different languages, so French DVDs with French subtitles and German and Spanish and Italian. Um, and um, I set up a project called Eurocap, uh, where learners would be able to borrow these DVDs and keep a diary on their experiences and then feed it all back to me. And that is in, in my book, Caption Media, 
in foreign language learning and teaching, and it forms an important chapter in the book, uh, the EuroCAP project. Um, I should say it was not easy to obtain these um, DVDs. Um, we had looked at Amazon, uh, the UK site, and none of the DVDs um, sold by Amazon UK contained uh, captions, same language subtitles. We had to go to Amazon France in order to buy French DVDs with French captions and Amazon Germany and so on um, to, to buy these DVDs uh, and set up our large collection. Uh, and, and so that was in a sense uh, the point uh, um, I had got to when it came to retire I had managed to do a, a second Eurocap project more DVDs more participants uh, and so on uh, and more interesting insights into the value of captions in particular that um, boxed sets seem to work better than films people love the continuity getting to know the characters uh, and they found um, the ones such as the French series Spin um, very, very useful indeed. I can't remember what it's called now in French. It's Spin in English. Anyway, how's that for the moment? Well, that's fantastic. You have really got us over two or almost three decades of work on captioning and subtitles and, in a way, accessibility because you have mentioned in your most recent monograph and other publications that captions do help more people than language learners, don't they? Yes, they do. That's right. Yes, I'm second language speakers in, in the United Kingdom, for example. Um, if you ask them about uh, whether they watch television with, with captions, yes, of course, why wouldn't I? You know, I've lived here for 20, 30 years, and of course I always watch television programs with captions. I wouldn't be able to follow EastEnders unless I had the, the, the captions. Mm -hmm. So it's useful for language learners, obviously for the deaf and hard of hearing, and uh, also for immigrants. Oh yes, yeah, there, there's quite a lot of research in the United States on um, what they call closed captions and immigrants. They have always been an important population for watching with closed captions. And it wasn't only the, the, the deaf lobby that enabled um, the Americans to have closed captions. It was also the fact that the immigrants were a very important population as well. Mm -hmm. There is a key term that you also mention in your 2016 book, which is that of the heart of listening. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, <laughs> clearly um, learners of a foreign language uh, or second language speakers, um, they are not hard of listening in the sense, um, hard of hearing in the sense that there isn't necessarily a physical disability. But there is a sort of disability in listening. In other words, their perceptual systems are tuned to their native language or perhaps another language. So there is some form of disability there. Uh, as far as listening is concerned, it's not the physical hearing, it's the listening which, which has the wrong tuning. And so that's why playing on hard of hearing, I call them hard of listening, because listening is an extremely difficult skill in, in a foreign language and takes a lot of effort and retuning in, in order to get it right. And so that's why I called it, in a sense, tongue-in-cheek, a bit of a joke, but uh, it seems to have stuck. It is a useful term, I think, yes, to refer to a, collect a collective that has different needs. So finally, uh, what will we see in the next five years, you think? Well, uh, it's difficult to say, really. It depends, of course, on companies like Netflix, Amazon Prime, uh, and the other big players in the new game in, in town, um, whether they acknowledge the value of these um, same language subtitles. Uh, so that they become really freely available uh, and whether it becomes easier or more difficult to, to record, store and transfer caption broadcasts as well. In the early days, for example, with VHS um, tape recordings, very easy to, to record and store 
and copy uh, and use them in different ways. What we've found with DVDs and downloads and these black boxes recording programs for us and time slipping is there is less flexibility. It's quite difficult to take clips off DVDs. Um, it can be more difficult to use DVDs in the language classroom than it was using a VHS tape, for example. So there are huge advantages, and of course there is, there is so much more captioning than there used to be. But at the same time, as far as pedagogical value is concerned, it's not altogether clear whether life will become easier or, or more difficult. Certainly when there was the switch from VHS to DVD, life became more, more difficult for teachers. It didn't become easier. Uh, and so it's never quite certain whether things will improve in terms of language learning or whether they will become more difficult. And certainly for learners borrowing DVDs in the EuroCAP project, um, it was a great step forward. They loved the flexibility of having the DVDs and being able to switch captions on and off or even have captions in another language. Certainly that flexibility for the autonomous learner was very, very welcome indeed. Whether teachers can make use of that flexibility is, is another matter. All right, so it's Caption Media in Foreign Language Teaching, Subtitles for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing as Tools for Language Learning, edited by Palgrave Macmillan. Dr. Robert van der Plank, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.